Have you flown on Turkish Airlines in the last year? No. No. Okay, I then you're probably that. good. Okay. Are you sure you're not being paid off by Turkish Airlines to be such a big fan of Fenerbahce? I don't get if you if you talk to Fenerbahce fans, they do not like me, so I don't think that's that's a thing anyway. Um no. No. Well there's one difference between you and Eric Adams. Yeah. Welcome to the Locked On Women's Basketball Podcast Saturday edition. The only po- the only women's basketball podcast where the audio quality is even less consistent than Brianna Stewart's scoring output in a final series. Today, I am filling in as host because your valiant Hunter Cruz uh, apparently has a quote-unquote doctor's appointment at 11 a.m. on a Saturday, dealing with uh, some kind of combination of St. Vitus's dance and the horrors. Locked on Women's Basketball starts now. You are Locked On Women's Basketball, your daily podcast on women's basketball. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome. You are Locked On to Women's Basketball. My name is Emily Adler, and I am your Saturday co-host covering the WNBA and college basketball with a focus on the game, behind the game, and player development. Thank you for making Locked On Women's Basketball your first listen every day. And remember that Locked On Women's Basketball is free and available on all platforms, including YouTube. Today, I am joined by my usual co-host, Lincoln. Lincoln, who contributes to all of our draft scouting and player development coverage, as well as this accursed podcast, and special guest, Eric Nemchok. Eric Nemchok is a co-host of uh, the only better podcast out there than ours, the Double Down WNBA podcast, which has recently revived itself between him and godfather to my cat, Stephen Trinkwald. Eric is also a contributor to Swish Appeal. Eric, say hi to the folks. Hi, the folks. I appreciate you having me on. Um, yes, Double Down WNBA is back in a slightly smaller capacity than previously. We recorded one episode, and then I don't know what's going on right now, but we're not not back. Um, it's basically whatever. Because Stephen's got some things going on. You know, uh, he's a busy man, so it's pretty much up to him what happens. But yeah, otherwise, I'm writing a Swish appeal and uh, probably still spending a little too much time on Twitter. It's like Texas football. You're existing in the Schrodinger's cat uh, version of back. Yeah, you could put it that way. That's, Simultaneously that's good... back and yeah. not back. On back a scale of we're so Barack to it's so Jover, we are we are we are trending towards the former. Somewhere in the Barack, yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Speaking of being back, what's back is our uh, draft boards. What's not back is my ability to do segues. So we have brought Eric on because Eric is uh, one of the foremost guys who knows prospects and guys who knows, you know, what players who are in, who are in college are going to be good in the pros. Famously, he decided to include Queen Egbo in his 2022 draft board uh, against our advice. And what do you know? She got drafted and is a half decent pro. So today we're here to talk about our preseason draft board for those of you who may not have seen it yet. It came out last Sunday at thenexthoops.com. You can find it uh, under our WNBA features. You can find it under our draft coverage. Um, But we have ranked 20, I want to say 29 preseason players who could be uh, drafted come April, as well as a few players to watch and uh, one international draft and stash in addition to those who are actually on the board. Um, For those of you unfamiliar with with our setup, we of course, rank players. This is a draft board, not a mock draft. So this is not what we are saying we are expecting to happen in terms of draft order. Heaven knows that we expect Nisa Mara to go way higher than we have her and Asia Sikfa to go way lower. But this is the order that we take them in in, in order of basically what we expect from, you know, the, the first like four or five years of their w, WNBA careers in terms of how good they will be. They are more importantly than ranking. They are tiered off according to quote unquote future value, which we will get into what that means as we go through the players. Um I want to start off with you, Lincoln. What did you think of the process overall that that led to the draft board? How did this compare to years prior? We've been doing this for basically three years now. Yeah, we have more players ranked than we ever have before. Um there's a Was lot that a of good idea. Yeah, I, there's a lot of good basketball players out here. Um 
this is this is just going to be a, a fun draft class. There's not as many like players that we think are going to make all WNBA teams and be in MVP contention. But there's just like 15 players that could stick on a roster and be positive contributors for several years to come. Very, very fun class. Eric, you, I think, but you've done, especially. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Sorry to interrupt. Eric, you've been doing this longer than, definitely longer than we have. How does this compare to you in terms of, in, in terms of depth, in terms of, yeah, at least in terms of depth and also in terms of the high end? Yeah, there's, I think there's definitely a lot more depth in this draft class than previously, uh, but at certain positions, right? I think there are a lot of uh, lead guard prospects. There are a lot of big prospects, not a lot of wing prospects, at least right now. You know, there's a lot of college basketball to be played. A lot can happen over the course of one season. But uh, one thing that I'm looking for in particular is is which lead guard is really going to establish herself as, uh, obviously, after Paige Beckers, who is the hands-on number one prospect at the moment. Um, which lead guard? Because, you know, like, I think each of them has a, a certain amount of strengths. Some of them have some very outstanding strengths. Some of them have some very clear weaknesses. Uh, I don't want to speak for you two, but what I'm looking for here, in, in accordance with that depth, which of these lead guards is going to separate themselves from the rest of the pack? Okay. Um, and I guess it's a good year for a lot of depth because we have another WNBA team coming next year. So, we're good. We got two more coming in the year after that. Actually, going off, so going off that, who are, you know, obviously we have, you know, you have players in the high end when it comes to lead guards like Olivia Miles. You have players sort of on the back end of, you know, quote unquote lead guards like, um, like uh, a Sarah Andrews, arguably a Lucy Olson. I'm wondering, you know, in terms of where do you sort of cut off the tier of like guards you're looking to separate themselves and what are you looking for there? Because, you know, obviously what you're looking for from Raven Johnson and what you're looking for from, like, Charlie Sledger Walker is a little bit different. Right. Right. For sure. For sure. Um, I'm just going to go down the list real quick, if you don't mind. Um, I have a few names. Uh, Olivia Miles, obviously, awesome player, tremendous player. I got to see how she plays alongside Hannah Hidalgo. Mm. Because the last mm. time we saw Miles fully healthy for Notre Dame, uh, she was she was the, the, the player. She was the lead guard, the lead lead guard. And then you had her injured, and Hidalgo came in, and she did a lot of amazing things with the basketball as well. So how can Miles function maybe when the ball isn't in her hands as often? Because I know you all noted this on her draft board, but she's got one weakness, really inconsistent three-point jump shooter. Um, I know you noted the, the weird form. Um, that's something that just got, it has to get better. You know, it has to get better. Um, how much off-ball gravity can Miles really generate? Because that backcourt has the potential to be totally amazing. And it's also got the potential to be kind of a janky fit because both of these players are used to having the ball in their hands most of the time. So it might take Notre Dame a little bit, uh, little time to figure that out. Um, right. Honestly, what, honestly, when it comes to Miles, I think she's like a good enough like cutter, and and she moves well without the ball. She reads the floor sure. well. But like to me, it's almost I don't care like how much she moves because she's such an insane passer and driver. Like I want her running thirty percent usage. So like, yeah. can she just hit the pull up elbow jumpers? Can she hit those? Off all threes. Right, right. Um, next one I have is Rory Harmon. Uh, probably my favorite guard to watch. Um, she's coming off a bad injury. Uh, mm-hmm. which stinks. And she's so dependent on her athleticism, her game. She's, she's just so explosive. And she's such a tenacious defender. But she doesn't really have the height to make up for it if that's not there. You know, uh, you also noted this in your draft board. I do my research. Uh, <laughs> the list of short lead guards without a consistent three-point jump shot who have extended WNB success is pretty short, right? Mm-hmm. So I think Harmon, that's the one thing she's really lacking. And that's something that I think she could probably develop in her, in her final season. Um, can she go back to school for one more year? I forget. Uh, she, uh, she probably can because she probably got a medical redshirt from last year. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. So if she goes back to school, I mean, that's, that's another point of emphasis. For her, but I really like watching her play. Uh, Tahina Papa, in my opinion, is, do you consider her a lead guard or no? We considered her a lead guard coming out of Oregon. We consider uh, her a combo now. I think I, I, I don't want to say soured, but I think what she did in the pick and roll at Oregon was maybe a little bit more fraudulent than what she did at the, in the pick and roll at South Carolina last year. Lincoln, bring it back. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. yeah I, I think she's got, 
I think she's got lead guard skills. I think she's got a lead guard game. Um, in fact, I think she's pretty much pro ready. Locked on women's basketball is brought to you by Hims. Your sex life is important, but your schedule is busy. You don't have time to go to the doctor's office to get treated for ED. Through Hims, you can get a personalized ED treatment without stepping foot outside your door. Hims is changing men's health care by providing access to affordable sexual health treatments from the comfort of your couch. The process is 100% online. Just answer a series of questions on their site and a medical provider will determine the right treatment option. If prescribed, your medication ships directly to you in discreet packaging for free. No insurance is needed and one low price covers everything from treatments to ongoing care. So start your free online treatment today with a visit at hymns.com slash locked on. That's H-I-M-S dot com slash locked on for your personalized ED treatment options. Options. Hymns.com slash locked on. The products mentioned are chewable compounded products, which are not approved by or verified for safety or effectiveness by the FDA. Prescriptions require an online consultation with a healthcare provider who will determine if appropriate. Restrictions apply. See website for details and important safety information. Subscription required. Price varies based on product and subscription plan. You know, obviously, yeah, again, a, a lot of it has to happen between now and then, but she's got a lot of things that a WNBA lead guard needs to be good at and have a long career in terms of just the fundamentals. She can play with or without the basketball. She's a tremendous three-point shooter spotting up. She just plays with such good pace and such good tempo. Um, her floor game, her basketball IQ is extremely high. I think the one question I would have about her is her lack of rim pressure. Mm-hmm. But you look at what She's the system she's playing in a South Carolina right now. That's not really a big deal for them. And I don't really care about that weakness for her as much as I care about the other weaknesses for the other lead guards. I just yep. think any team is going to love to have Pow Pow on their on their roster, and she's probably not going to get past the top six or seven. Um, Absolutely. I know you compared her to, uh, or is it post injury Sue Bird, and that <laughs> she's really good at moving without the ball, still yeah. hitting with spot up point shots, and the lack of rim pressure just. It just doesn't apply because she's so good in every other area that a lead guard really needs to be good at. Um, well, she improved to... really, really strongly as a defender last year, which is so nice to see. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, then her, her backcourt partner, uh, Raven Johnson, I think she's got – it's interesting that they're on the same team because she's kind of the inverse of Pow Pow in terms of what their strengths are, um, which is maybe why they're such a good fit together. Uh, she is just a complete physical package. She's so athletic. She's got those long arms. Uh, shout out to Hunter for getting the wingspan data, by the way. Um, she's still got a way to With go, his in, my opinion. in the locker room. I'm sorry? Yeah, Hunter just carried he got, he not only got... her around for like a yeah. month in March and April last year and got a whole bunch of wingspans. And, and we that's the investigative him journalism that. that we need. I love that. I love that. Hunter's not and, here then, and, and then got accused of like violating women's like bodily autonomy by LSU, a school who's... Uh, whose athletic administration and specifically basketball oversight definitely cares about women's bodily autonomy and right to decisions. Right. Um, but anyway, I think what I'm looking for for Johnson from this year is uh, just in terms of a, an actual malleable offensive skill. She's super athletic. She's got the, the off the dribble game, but, you know, I think, uh oh, did we lose Lincoln? No, we didn't. Um, Don't acknowledge that. You just got to power through it. <laughs> powering through it. Just powering through it. Gotcha. Um, so is she. Is she going to be a, a top tier pick and roll operator? Is she going to be a top tier downhill scorer, like rim pressure, like the opposite of Pow Pow, right? Um, I think she can get a lot of offense out of her own defense because she's such a good point of attack defender. Uh, but when you think about that at the WNBA level, what is her what is her malleable offensive skill? Absolutely. Um, and then finally, I have Sarah Andrews, and this is an interesting player because I like her game, but I'm just kind of wondering what her standout strength is. In mm-hmm. relation to the rest of these players, you know, uh, she's got she's got a pretty good jump shot. She's pretty athletic. You know, not not top tier in any of these categories though. So, what is her what is her standout strength? I th- think she's going to be at a, she's going to end up being a safe pick, maybe towards like the it's hard to predict now, but maybe like towards the end of the second round or something like that, just for a team to fill out their training camp roster. 
But in terms of comparing her to these other lead guards, what is her argument over Pow Pow? What is her argument over Johnson? What is her argument over Harmon? What is her argument over, you know, maybe Georgia Amor, for instance, another one? Um, mm-hmm. she, she, she's good at a lot of things, but not great at any one thing. And Absolutely. that's one thing that I think WNBA teams are going to be looking for. It's one of the notes he put in the top of the board. Players who, who have narrow specialties are a lot easier to work with than players who have a wide range of pretty good. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and there, like there's nothing wrong with a player who's, you know, uh, jack of all trades, master of none. But mm-hmm. it's it's not as exciting when you're talking about pro upside. Yep. So coming up after the break, we'll continue to dive into these players and specifically how we've looked at them across the years and uh, dive into some of our differences and similarities in scouts. And we're back. I'm still your host, Emily Adler, and we appreciate you for making Locked Women's Basketball your first listen every day. Eric, I'm curious, specifically with some of these players, have any of them, especially the lead guards you mentioned, I want to stay on that topic for a minute. Have your scouts on any of them changed considerably over the years? So, like, so for me, for instance, I mentioned Pow Pow. Maybe the playmaking a little lower on than I was at Oregon. The defense has taken a huge step forward. Raven, you know, the scoring between her redshirt freshman year and last year, night and day. Sarah Andrews was someone I was super high on after her sophomore year. Insane production in her first full season under Nikki Collin. She, to me, was, I think, the third best guard in this, in what was the 2024 class. Before she reclassified, Paige reclassified, Charlize reclassified. Tina Pau Pau reclassified, and but like it feels like like you're saying that sort of high end impact of their slid back, and I'm also must running yeah from you and Lincoln sort of how these have changed over time. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I've I've always been a big Pau Pau guy. Like as you might have noticed, like I've got some sky stuff here. I, I do like the Chicago sky uh, <laughs> most of the time, and I would love to have Pau Pau on, on the sky. But we're keeping this objective. I would <laughs> say, I would say, um, for starters, Georgia Amor. I'm really interested to see what she does at Kentucky. I think maybe I was getting a little bit starry-eyed because of the uh, this crazy jump shot she's hitting. Um, but if that shot that that shot isn't falling, is she going to be able to compete physically? And that's something mm-hmm. that I'm not sure is going to be able to be addressed. You know, it, it's just it's something you either have or you don't. Um, can she become at least a passable defensive player? Can she put that rim pressure on without, you know, her, her shake, if, if, as, as my podcast partner, Stephen Trinkwald likes to call it, her shake comes from, from like ball handling, right? Not from mm-hmm. general explosiveness. And so playing in a different conference now, which I think is going to be something to watch, is she going to be able to maintain that kind of production um, without playing next to uh, an elite post-up player like Elizabeth Kitley, who I know both of you really, really love, right? Um, so Georgia Amor is, is one that I'm maybe not as high on anymore. Maybe playing in, in the SEC is going to make her better. I, don't, I mean, I don't know. Um, I'm not sure the I SEC agree. is a better conference right now. Yeah, right. I, uh, I agree with you. I'm on, on Sarah Andrews. I really, really liked her. Uh, and I don't not like her now, but it's like I'm, I'm still kind of waiting for that next. That next mm-hmm, season. Mm-hmm. I'm still kind of waiting for that, that upperclassman jump. And, and maybe we see that this season. Who knows? Um, and then I would say, yeah, Raven Johnson. Raven Johnson, because she did take that, I mean, it was so obvious how hard she worked on that three-point jump shot. Yep. You know, from, from the from the getting waved off in, in the uh, in the final four there to actually hitting that three-point jump shot, that spot of three-point jump shot. I think it's still, I, I still need to see it for another year, you know, because a lot of those shots are, are completely uncontested. So She's it's still hitting the free throws as much as you'd like. So, yeah, you, 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 exactly, you just need exactly. a sample. Yeah, so it's a difference between hitting that completely uncontested jump shot because you've got six foot seven in the post who's getting double teamed all the time, so just kicking it out to a wide open three point shooter. It's the difference between that and actually hitting that off the dribble three point jump shot when the defense goes under the screen. So I think she's still got to work on that, um, but the the trajectory is is promising right now. And then you got to mention the the pedigree, right? Uh, Don Staley has produced some pretty pretty darn good players in recent years. So I have to uh, I have to assume that given the trajectory that Raven Johnson is on, she's going to have a tremendous season, and she's going to put herself in in, in first round consideration. Yeah. 
Hunter, checking in real quick with a word from our sponsor, FanDuel. You've heard us talk a lot about FanDuel, America's number one sports book. So when you get a hunch in the middle of a game, you can check out the latest stats, view live play-by-play, and so much more on the same page where you place your bet. You can start, you'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. Again, that's FanDuel.com to get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. Anyways, back to the show. I, Lincoln, I especially want to ask, you know, especially after we've done the past two, the the past two summers of, you know, the retrospects and we've looked at players, you know, sometimes we've just looked at senior tape. If we've had to crunch it, you know, we've only have three days turnaround. We have jobs, but I'm, you know, for the players we've looked at, we looked at three years, four years of production, you know, I think the classic example here is Nafisa Collier of how much it matters that your like development arc is actually still improving when you get drafted. I wonder if that factors in with these guards and actually with any other players in the draft that have stood out to you. And actually, really, if maybe, maybe if you differ from me in terms of how much you weigh that. Well, you know, I really do think that showing improvement over four seasons in college is important and having some sort of consistent production I think the player that rose the most for us from our uh, boards last year is Kiki Ariafin, who showed just a totally different side of her game uh, in her junior season at Stanford. She's guarding legitimately two through five and mm-hmm. doing incredibly well there. She, the, I think one of the things that caught our eye early in the season was their game against Florida State, where she's picking up Tania Latson for most of the game. and That was the first game for us, yep. Yeah, that was the game that we were like, oh, this is different. And then (laughs) she continued to be a tremendously efficient post scorer who started to stretch it out to 16 to 18 feet. Uh, Those little little bits and pieces of three-point shooting, maybe that's something that uh, will uh, jump in a, a better conference this year with USC in the Big Ten being... A consensus top four team in the country going into the the season. Uh, and at the really like, next to Ryan Marshall at the f- who's good, who, almost certainly Kiki's yeah. the four, Ryan's the five, yeah. as opposed to Brink, who was who was sort of to or actually a stretch a stretch big. Ryan Marshall does not is not stretch. She does not stretch. So no, they are definitely going to need Kiki to either hit long twos or threes. Mm-hmm. And it's it's going to be a fun, a very very fun team to watch. I'm just really excited to watch all these people play basketball. I can't <laughs> wait for the season Agreed. to be here. Agreed. Yeah, I, sure. can't I like wait. basketball. Basketball's fun. College basketball's fun because especially I think in the context of like this kind of stuff. Because like it's one thing if you know, if you're on the beat at South Carolina, if you're on the beat at UConn, it's it's a very fun season regardless. But like I think from our perspective, because the WNBA season, it's it's the season, it's the pro season. You know, we are heading towards what, you know. What if what happens tomorrow is similar to what's happened over the past week? This could this could be one of, if not the greatest game like in league history to cap off maybe the greatest playoff series in league history. Um, and it's just such high stakes. Then we go to college and we're like, okay, let's just see like a bunch of like a, a bunch of people whose prefrontal cortexes haven't fully developed, and let's just have them like run around for 40 minutes and see what happens. Give me the ESPN multi view. I am throwing ESPN multi-view on my TV. I'm watching four different preseason tournament games at once. It's They're playing in the Bahamas. They're playing in Des Moines, Iowa for some reason. They're playing... Like Henderson, in- Nevada? Yeah. They're all over the place. Let's... Give me all the, the Thanksgiving tournaments. I'm so excited. I Lincoln, do you, have a, do you have a Flow Hoop subscription? No, I refuse <laughs> to uh, accede to the evil demands. Yeah, in in years past, so before last year, we would usually split one month of flow hoops to watch the Thanksgiving tournaments. Uh, but starting last year, we finally got access to Redacted, so now we uh, we don't have to. Love Redacted. Love I love that. YouTube. Love that for you. I, I love YouTube. Shout out to um, Women's yeah, Hoop Masterclass for posting 30-minute game recaps. I eat those up. Very helpful, yeah, for sure. So before we get into our third segment, where we will basically just continue the discussion we've already been having, uh, we will take you to another short break. So 
So now that we're back, I, I want to ask, so for our last segment, I want to ask Eric, what are the biggest discrepancies between where you would have players coming into the season and where we've put them, either in pure ranking or, in, or you know, because this is our stick around here, future value? Okay, so first a disclaimer, I am very, very bad at remembering what that future value metric looks like. I just get link into, okay, good, thank you. Um, I just put them in tiers. <laughs> I just put them in tears. Maybe I'm old school. Maybe I'm just I'm just not smart enough. I don't know. I was very surprised. Let me. I'm I'm, I'm reading through your uh, through your board. I know that's why my eyes aren't uh, looking. Um, I was kind of surprised at how low you had Harmon. Although I understand why. I understand why. Right. And I was also a little bit surprised at how low you had Milanga. Dominique Milanga. How? What are you looking for there in terms of because because. I am not the nearly the international buff that uh, that Hunter is, and I'm kind of disappointed that he wasn't here because I was going to ask him like, "What is your process going? Uh, what does your process like this look like?" Um, <laughs> in a uh, so, you've, so you've got similar to Tommy Fag Ben like Nick Claxton, big Nick Claxton guy. I love that comparison. Um, one thing I look for uh, I look for for international prospects has nothing to do with them whatsoever. It has everything to do with who is trying to stash that pick. In, in the WNBA draft, because some teams, I'm not going to name them, but some teams love hoarding draft picks and, and always end up having more draft picks than they have available roster spots, like like first round <laughs> draft picks. So they have to end up using these uh, these deferral picks on international prospects. Again, not naming any names. I refuse to name any names. Down yeah, yeah. Anything I'll, I'll name the names. It's Atlanta and Dallas. Okay. All right. Lincoln said it, not me. Thank you very much. Um, also, kind of New York, but they they're, they're at least confident with it. But the thing is, but they at least have the high end talent to justify doing yes. that, right? Yes. Um, so I guess what I'm what I'm trying to is say this Alicia is Alicia Gracelander. I'm sorry. No, <laughs> I'm not Alicia slandering Gray? Alicia Gray. This is, if anything, no. it's Dan Pat over not quite slander. Not quite. Sl- so what? What's in between? This is nothing to do with Leash. Okay. Okay. Well, what I was going to say was, um, I, I think it's it's kind of interesting in the WNBA how you can be taking. A, a player's reluctance to come over or inability to come over or whatever, there's a lot of factors that go into it, um, can actually increase their draft stock in some cases because they are trying to use that deferral pick and not completely waste it. So for a player like Milanga, who obviously has tremendous upside, but French players tend to have more roadblocks in, in coming over to the WNBA for one reason or the other. Um, Shout out Tony Parker. Out, out, out yeah, the bane of our lot, existence. Man. Thanks a lot. Uh, does that, I guess it's a two-parter, does that go into your consideration at all? And I guess the second question would be, why is she only 40 VB? Because there was some discrepancy between you all when making this Yes, course, absolutely. Right? So we mentioned this on, it might have been last week, or we mentioned this at some point, but Malanga, and I'll get into this a little more in a second, but Malanga is probably the greatest internal discrepancy we've had on a broadcast. Broadcast? not a podcast, a prospect since we started this. Um, but before I get into that, I will identify some Longas ranked 14th overall. For us, she is at the top of our 40 uh, uh, future value tier. And then Rory Harmon is uh, basically just dead dead middle of our 30 future value tier. You can kind of ignore her numerical ranking. They're half the players in that tier are completely going to fall off anyway. Uh, for reference for what that means, a 40 future value means that we think the median outcome for Malanga is a rotation caliber player. So think like, think a consistent contributor to like a title contender who then barely plays in the playoffs or someone like who's Han like, Zhu. yeah, or someone in like at like the top end of the, someone who's like the sixth, seventh woman on like a mediocre team. Uh, and then a 30 future value is someone who uh, basically gets a lot of training camp contracts and often sticks to, to the end of the roster from them. Um, so you're basically projecting their future role. Uh, yeah, not I, I I don't want to say role because that is what like the offensive defensive archetypes are for, but just in terms of like level of contribution to a to to a to a first or second division team. Okay. Got it. Got it. Yeah. That's that, that's sort of the easiest way to tear it off. I, I, and yeah, I can start with Malanga. So Hunter is the high grade on Malanga. He had, I think a he had a he had at the very least a five. Okay, yeah, yeah. Lincoln's confirming he had a five. A five is an average rotation player or um or basically a a borderline starter on a on a uh, contender a starter on a playoff team 
that's a pretty high bar for reference. Like Civic is at a five. Uh, Olivia Miles is, is is just above a fifty five. Tina Pow is at a five for us. Uh, I heard as I had her as a three, and it's not that I don't like her as a prospect. It's that I I to me she is so volatile that I can I just can't see investing enough draft draft capital in that as compared to the other players in this draft. Like to me, she's a, she is what I would call a priority draft in stash, like middle back, the second round, top, the third round. If I'm a GM, I am absolutely targeting her once like my preferred college players are off the board. But for me, it's so volatile. Specifically, there are some feel aspects, which I think are a lot harder to improve and usually more innate to a player's game. There's some feel aspects that are, are either missing or are a little more flashy than I'd want them to be at this yeah. age. And so for me, it's just really tough to get behind that. I, I totally understand why people have her higher. Lincoln is actually the median grid on her. So he's probably a better reflection of where we're at. I think she is a tremendous athlete who moves very well at six, six. And that's the reason why I get her as high as I do. Cause there's, there's a lot of upside, as you said, but it's, it's, she's very raw, uh, which kind of expected for a 19 year old who's playing like her second full season in the top French division. Um, she, she does a lot of things that are very good, but there are moments where she kind of does look a bit lost on the court. Uh, there's moments where it's just not where you want it to be, but she's, she's certainly making plays. I might be talking myself into, uh, Malanga as a prospect more the more I talk about it I don't know but she's just she's a very uh it's it's a project to draft her yes, it, yes. It's, it, you have to put in a lot of development and there's a lot of teams that just aren't going to be willing to put in that development work with uh, a 19 year old foreign player that's a question if they'll ever even come over yeah definitely definitely the biggest thing between sort of me and Hunter, we're obviously we're looking at the same tape, we're looking at the same player, we agree on the same baseline. But I think at this stage, it is a question of how much each of us, you know, really thinks different skills are easier or harder to improve. You know, I think we both like the potential to shooting, but like, you know, her navigation for me and drop and at the level is way, way harder for me to believe that that's improvable than I think where Hunter's at. And I'm not saying that I'm correct. Like, I have no idea if I'm correct. This is sort of the hunch that I've gotten from the from the scouting that we've done through the, through the years. And at the very least, she's going to be a great data point for, for what we're working with here. Um, and then, yeah, on the subject of Rory Harmon, like, I, for me, it's like for me at least, it's a combination of a couple things. You know, I know we all basically, I think we all had a 30 grade on her. I can't speak to exactly why we all did. Um, but I think there's decent overlap for me. It's, you know, we can talk about like the last short, the last particularly short, but also college great uh, guard to play for Vic Schaefer, Morgan William, I think had a similar sort of concept in terms of offensive athleticism, impact to the game, pick and roll, um, defensive tenacity, and also couldn't shoot. And so Morgan William also had a plus wingspan. I think they were like a plus eight. They were like five three with a five level wingspan. Tell UConn that she can't shoot. <laughs> tell UConn that she can't shoot. She okay. could. She, 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 she could shoot, not consistently, but she could shoot. Uh, she had like a plus eight wingspan. Roy Harmon, what she's got going for, she does have a plus one and a half wingspan, which is solid. Like Rory Harmon, I think will contribute to a training camp every year for the next decade, or she will contribute as like an eleventh player every year for another, for her rookie contract. But I think the upside there is trickier to get to than like Georgia Amor is either not going to work or she's going to be a starting caliber offensive guard. Um, and for me with Harmon, like I have a lot of faith in the deceleration. I have a lot of faith in, you know, the ball pressure and the ability to pick up 94 feet for freaking starter minutes uh, in an entire game, but it's so little room for error. And we already, I think, see in a lot of games where it just doesn't work. Like, basically, whenever she goes up against Sarah Andrews, Texas usually has a big problem. Lincoln? Yeah, it's it's kind of in, in that vein. She's the, the shooting is definitely a big concern. 
um, because it's just so hard to create offensive value if they're just going to ignore you when you don't have the ball. And I'm I'm not sure that she gets across the threshold of being a high enough level ball handler at the next level to merit uh, the the just total uh, apathy that defenses will feel if she doesn't have the ball in her hands. Mm-hmm. It's, okay. a, it's a tough That's line to cross. Eric, anything else? Uh, anything else about you between uh, between your notes and uh, and our board? Maybe, uh, but I actually did have a question for the two of you. Okay. Um, which wing players are you looking to break out this season, if any? Because, like I said, when I at the top of the episode, I was I need to see something from some wing this season. Uh, I like Felia, but maybe not so much as a first round prospect. Um, I think which which one have you called? Um, which one have you called tonight? Rivers or wing? Uh, by wing, do you mean like a wing period or a wing question mark? Did anybody call her a wing period? No. Okay, never mind then. Uh, wing question mark. I I, I agree with you. I Thank agree you. with wing question mark. Um, because I, I she is a fascinating physical uh specimen. Um, but it's like, what in wh- where is the offense coming from for her? Uh, she genuinely might be the greatest athletic prospect that we've had in draft history. You think so? I'm not or saying like, she is, but like, she's top five at the very least, without a doubt. She's, I mean, she's truly got the potential to be a special defensive player, but I mean, the offense is like, yeah, where on earth is it coming from? Um, so it, it's gonna be like what Sonia Citron. Maybe Rivers, depending on if she's a wing question mark or a combo guard. Um, Philia, and then who else are we thinking from the wing position? Because teams need wings. Teams need wings. Yes, yeah, so, so Reed Hall. Reed Hall. Yeah, okay. I was going to say, so, so, so going through the board, depending on how you define wing, Bree Hall, uh, Asya Sikva could, or Sivka could qualify, again, depending on how you on uh, how you call a wing. Cheyenne think- Sellers, okay. uh, Azzy Fudd. Uh, Anastasia Kosu, Maddie Would Shear. We're not. We're not going to talk about her. So, what'd you say? Like but, I was. I was just wondering if you consider Kosu to be a a wing long term. Well, we're talking about players who can play the three. Fair. Her position is Gabby. <laughs> I like that. By the way, I like that when I saw your board. That was that was cute. Yeah, it uh, all it comes with all the strengths and weaknesses of being a Gabby. But yeah, I mean, in okay. terms of uh, I'll let Lincoln speak speak for himself. But but in terms of what I'm looking for, you know, uh, so Asia Sivka was injured for most of last year. When she played, she was excellent for um one of like if not the best team in Europe. Period. Um, there's a lot of potential there. I mean, we're talking about an international teenager, so it's always you know, flexible in every direction with that. You know, Hunter's a little higher on the ball handling than I am. I think I'm higher on the defense probably than he is, um, or at least in the help defense. So it's it's always nice with players that age to just get a bigger sample size, for God's sakes, and be able to see sort of what flashes are turning into actually real play, what what uh, flashes are sort of just staying flashes or, or, or dissipating. I think on that note, like, Anast- I'll talk about Anastasia Kosu sticking to the internationals. Like this is a player who recently went back and watched, you know, play of her in like U 17s and U 19s. This is a player who basically every year that she has played semi-professional basketball has been three years younger than the level that she has played at and has also been the best player on the court. Like she demolished uh, Yovani Jim and Cheyenne Day Wilson and Tara Wallach when she played Canada again in U 19s as a 16 year old. This is a player who I think has been very special for a number of years. And I think if we see if we see these flashes of deceleration, these flashes of slashing, maybe solidify a little bit this year. It depends on how whether players would be willing to come over from Russia, given current uh, geopolitical considerations. But this is a player I think that the name probably doesn't mean much to most people. Maybe the impression I've gotten is there's not huge buzz in the industry there. But but I think you know if you get these more consistent slashing from her, we could be talking about like a very surprising name in the draft. For me, I'll just say 
I will be very interested to see what Vic and his staff can do with Layla Felia defensively. Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Because that's something that they, they work hard on down there. And I will be very interested to see if she can take a, a defensive leap and uh, be able to work off of a, a much better and stronger defensive infrastructure than what she had at Michigan and see if that can help her uh, find more ways to impact the game defensively. Right. Because l- l- last year, last year was one thing again, she had to, she had to really with, um, with Leia Brown gun, she had to really shoulder more offensive creation than the year before, but she was still a really good defender. But the year before was also just excellent play from her. You know, she's already, I think she's already a, a good help defender, at least for a backward player. Uh, yeah, if Vic can unlock more of that, that would be, I mean, that would be special. Eric, tell the people where they so, can find you. Where they can find me. Um, well, I took the liberty of putting my my Twitter handle on my display name, at Nemchak E. Uh, Lincoln does not have his, but that's okay. Uh, if you want to find me on Twitter, I, 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 I'm not going to say do it, or don't do it. It's just probably a little bit of a gamble, but I would appreciate it if you do. Um, you can find my actual work, though, at Swish Appeal, which is an SB Nation affiliate. Uh, this offseason, WNBA offseason, I mean, I'm going to be covering draft prospects, like always. I'm going to be covering EuroLeague Women, which is the premier FIBA competition overseas, which is a lot of fun. Um, I, I always like to plug that because that's where this season is a little bit different because you've got now you've got AU, you've got Unrivaled. Um, the actual level of competition in EuroLeague may not be as high, but it's still a lot of fun to watch players who, you know, have either maybe fallen off your radar or didn't really get a big shot in the WNBA, have big roles overseas. That's just that's just something I really enjoy watching. Um, so I'm going to be covering that, usually weekly articles about that. Um, oh, and, and yeah, that's that's where you can find me, over at Squish Appeal and on uh, Twitter. And maybe Blue Sky, depending on how things go within the next couple months or so. Let's go. Um, I think I, I might be ready to finally make that leap. But Let's go. Yet. And thanks, everyone else, for making Locked in Women's Basketball your first listen today. And join us back for continued WNBA coverage next week. And join thenexthoops.com tomorrow for coverage of what could be one of the biggest games in league history. Have a terrific weekend.